Well, hopefully we've got a... Uh, hopefully we won't see a repeat of last round. Yes. That was tragic. I'd love to see another amazing deck strategy. With luck, that will be our last penalty-determined match yes. for More the dueling. duration of the tournament. That's what we need here. Some Yu-Gi-Oh. That'd be nice. All right. We are getting set up still. Yes. You know, it's actually harder than you'd think to run a 64-man playoff event. All right. Here we go. Ted Stravetti has brought um, a deck featuring the hands, artifacts, trap tricks, and uh, Brotherhood of the Fire of his bear, much like we saw earlier in round 10. And Zachary Leverett is playing Sylvan. Oh, all right. I see he's got the full complement of Curry Bandit there. He's also got is... a full complement of Vanity's Emptiness, which really? should be very interesting. It's only trap cards, huh? I wonder if Trevetti is aware of that. Well, he hasn't got any mystical space typhoons. He's got the hands to play around them. The interesting thing with Sylvans is that... Well, here's the thing. The question is, do you play Curry Bandit in Sylvans or not? Yeah. Do you take that risk against Breakthrough Skill? Like, Interestingly, Trevetti only mains one Breakthrough Skill, so that Curry Bandit could be huge if we see it early. And the other tricky thing is that, you know, if you're playing against Lightsworn or something, and I don't know if Zach Leverett knows what he's playing against yet, but if you were to play against Lightsworn and pass off a Curry Bandit, you could just lose yeah. without realizing it. He's in the fortunate position of being in a matchup where Trevetti's early game is very unlikely to present that number of threats that early. So this matchup may actually be in Leverett's favor right off the bat. One of the really neat uh, cards that are being teched in Sylvans is Blaster, Dragon Ruler of Infernos. You get a lot of hands where you wind up with multiple fire monsters in your hand that you can't play all at once. Like you wind up with Komashrumo, Hermitry, Hermitry, or something like that. And Blaster is a great way to get one of those cards out of your hand and into the graveyard where you can use it with Miracle Fertilizer or Soul Charge doesn't take up your normal summon, so you can just bring it right back with Miracle Fertilizer, and it destroys any problem card that your opponent has. Yeah, we saw a lot of it yesterday. I think it actually might have been in every Sylvan feature match we had. It is a super solid card, and if you aren't running it in your Sylvan deck, well, you should think about it. Keeping Komashrumo in the deck, too, a card that earlier on in this format was not super popular in all the regional top 8 decks we were seeing. Definitely not a must at that point, but seems far more important now. 2,000 defense, and it's basically Curry Bandit that doesn't leave you open and has a very good chance not to get waxed by breakthrough skill. Slower Curry Bandit, though. Slower Curry Bandit. <laughs> Tredi wins the opening die roll. I would assume he wants to go first, since the rule changes have not taken effect until Monday. And I believe we're just waiting for the signal to start the round. Trevetti is playing uh, three copies of Moraltuck and one of Bigaltuck, along with a pair of Artifact Ignition. It's a bit less than the suite we've seen of three Moraltuck, two Bigaltuck, three Ignition that's shown up quite a bit over the last month or so. Mm -hmm. I kind of like it, though. I'm not really a fan of the Beagle deck, because it's a card you don't want to draw that you play in case you draw the cards that you don't want to draw. It can be a little bit convoluted. He is playing Triple Traptix Mermelio, but no copies of Traptix Dianera. Again, in favor of the Brotherhood of the Firefest Bears instead. And a lot of the reasons why Deonia isn't showing up quite as often is that it's really a pain when you draw her first, yeah. and you have to wait for a Mirelio. Ted Shervetti, taking a peek over at the camera. He looks ready. Yeah, he looks confident, looks happy. Probably be happier if you knew he was playing only one main deck wiretap against a deck that has only three trap cards. That's going to work in his favor. Interesting thing a little bit easy. See how he decides to side deck later on, because there aren't many other 
wiretaps in there. That's it. After a momentary interruption, we are back. And it sounds like we are about to get the word to start. Quick handshake. Both of these competitors, obviously, very big names. Zach Leverett, very young, but came up through the, the Dragon Duel program. Took it all the way to the top in 2012, the Dragon Duel WCQ. Tez Trevetti, been a big name for years. Both very familiar, traveling to big events. And Trevetti starts off with Pot of Duality, revealing Trap Tricks Mirmilio, Fiendish Chain, and his one copy of Breakthrough Skill. That's that one breakthrough. You gotta, th you gotta think that he's gonna take the Leo, though, <coughs> and start off with a bottomless trap hole of some sort. Oh, yeah. Which is actually extremely strong against the Sylvan deck. Yep. Let's take a look. Now, Leverett is not running Rose Archer, which is very interesting because most of the success that we've seen from Sylvans has been with a triple Rose Archer in the yeah. main deck. And it could be that this comes back to hurt him. He's also running Upstart Goblin, which you don't really see in Sylvans. He clearly just really wants that, that enormous opening that Sylvans are capable of. Yeah, and that's going to be tough, facing down three back rows, one of which was free. And is Bottomless Trap Pull. He knows what it is. And there's the Goblin. Starts with Upstart Goblin. That's 1,000 more points he has to do. I'm really not a fan of Upstart Goblin in Sylvans. Yeah. It just seems to detract from what you're trying to do. But if it gets him to his Sylvan Charity faster, then more power to you. Setting one one monster card. There's pretty much only one thing that can be, but Trevetti doesn't know that yet, since all he's seen is an upstart goblin. Well, this late in the tournament, it's always tough to tell what kind of communication has gone on between the competitors. Ice Hand comes down for Trevetti, and he exceeds summons Abyss Dweller. No, it seems like he knows exactly what's going on. Yeah. And he detaches Miramaleo to activate its effect and swing in to the Kumashrumo. He's chosen to excavate. Vanities, another goblin, another goblin. Book, and a hermitry. Five excavations, only one monster. Bunch of stuff you don't really want to see. And uh, hermitry, of course, will not activate. And Komashrumo is down. Now, the thing with Upstart Goblin that's especially strange in this deck is that it's not really a non-existent card if you're flipping it up you're with your up excavation with ability. Your excavations yeah. or even your charities. It only doesn't count if you draw it. Plays back to Leverett. Do expect to see a lot more thinking with this deck than you would with a lot of the others. There are a lot of play sequences you have to go through in your mind. Leverett activates Mount Sylvania. Mount Sylvania. <laughs> Somebody once complained to me that Mount Sylvania wasn't as good as the Grand Spellbook Tower because it doesn't protect itself and it doesn't automatically draw you cards and it doesn't give you a special summon. Well, guess what it does do? It lets you cheat legally <laughs> by putting whatever card you want from your deck on top as long as it's a Sylvan card. Stack your deck, blow up cards in your opponent's turn. Good and deal. that plays to the strengths of Sylvans because their excavation abilities take a look at the cards on top of your deck, mm. see if they're plants, and if they are, they send them to the graveyard. And then for Sylvans, they all have an effect that activates when they're excavated and sent to the graveyard in this way. Now and he, it gets stuff like Spore into your graveyard. Well, yeah, he, uh, he tossed Spore for Mount Sylvania. Yeah. Which is super handy. That'll be good for a free tuner monster later on. Now, it's interesting to note that the Abyss Dweller was not immediately activated at the start of the turn. That's going to turn out to be pretty smart here because Trevetti will have to use it now during his own turn knowing that Marshall Leaf, Sylvan Marshall Leaf, is on top of the deck and will be checked for by Mount Sylvania at the end of his turn. Yeah. So he's kind of forced 
into a sequence of plays, but he has a decision to make. He can either attack the face down, which is probably another Kamashrumo with his 2200 attack of Bist Dweller, and in doing so, allow the Martial Leaf to trigger, or he can detach right now and basically just pass. I mean, he can run into the Komishrumo, but in that case, Lever he, probably he can force Lever to try and flip yeah. it on his own and expose himself to more risks there, expose mm -hmm. himself to Fiendish Chain, the Breakthrough. Yep, it's just when do you want to have to deal with that Hermitry? In the battle phase? Yeah. At the end of the turn? It's a very big decision very early in the duel. I think Trevetti probably knows he's in a somewhat favorable position right now, but the decision of how to leverage that into further advantage is not easy when you're so early in the game and facing such a, an incomplete set of information. Now he's taking a look at his extra deck, and it looks like he wants to try to make a Diamond Direwolf play here. That's very smart against what you would assume to be a Setco Mushroomo, and if he can pull it off... then he would be able to destroy Diamond Direwolf and the face down card without using his Abyss Dweller effect quite yet. Soul Charge from Mermelio. Mm -hmm. Takes a thousand, but will activate Mermelio's ability when she's special summoned, which uh, destroys a Spell or Trap. And he goes with the face down, which was a bluff Miracle Fertilizer. That could hurt. Coach Soldier Wolfbark is next. And her season summoning Kane Gorgon, Anti Luminescent Anti Knight. Knight. In that case, it seems like his plan is to redirect the destruction from the Marsha Leaf instead of using his Abyss Dweller ability. He ends his turn with that. And Marsha Leaf is activated. Or it seems it's not activated because he doesn't want to see it get redirected. Nope. Well, he winds up doing it anyways. Can we get Marsh Leaf real fast? And Kane Gorgon's effect is chained to switch the target. Now, Sylvan Marsh Leaf, it can target any monster on the field. Uh, it looked like Leverett was arguing for a second they could only target an opponent's monster, but that is not the case. So Kane Gorgon has been activated. The target has switched to Kamishrumo. And things went pretty wrong pretty fast for Leverett. That was huge. Not a lot of cards in that hand. And he's still got Mount Sylvania, but he does have to discard or send a plant from the field of the graveyard every time he wants to stack something. Leverett has a second Miracle Fertilizer, which is a shot in the dark against those four face-down cards, one of which is Bottomless Trap Hole. Yeah. Soul Charge comes next. The real question is, how many life points is he willing to lose to it? He's going to go for Spore. And Komishrumo only. Summon is successful. Leverett loses 2,000 life points. And then he sends the Komishrumo to the graveyard to activate Mount Sylvania's ability. Now, the thing he's got to remember here is that if he tries to target something on the field, Kane Gorgon can redirect it. And if he threatens any particular play from the graveyard, Abyss Dweller can be activated before he gets a chance to use Spell Speed 1 abilities to prevent him from doing much of anything. Two Komishrumas have been banished. And that's to summon Blaster, Dragon Rulers of Inferno. Dragon Ruler of Infernos, which we talked about before. Mm -hmm. That's a very good thing to have right about now. So now he has a Synchro play. Synchro summon for a level 8 monster. 
Stardust Dragon is probably a Stardust Spark, Stardust yeah. Spark Dragon, one of the Stardust Dragons. The tricky thing with Stardust Spark Dragon, though, is that it is a targeting effect. That could be the death now. Teshravetti goes ahead and takes a look at the text, and so will we. I imagine Tej just registered where we registered. Fortunately for Leverett, it can only target a face-up card you control. that Leverett controls. Yeah. But he has got another one. He's got that Mount Sylvania on the field. All right, Trevetti goes ahead and makes a quick check of his face downs. Trevetti could have Sanctum. Sanctum doesn't target. Leopard passes on the Stardust, and Brotherhood of the Firefist Bear comes down on Trevetti's side. Now, none of those are big enough mm -hmm. to attack over the Stardust. It's got 25 to Kane Gorgon's 2450. But Forbidden Lance is going to go ahead and weaken the Stardust. Now, even though the Stardust can allegedly protect itself, oh, he's going to go ahead and let it. So, even though the Stardust was able to protect itself once. He was able to go ahead and make another attack due to its reduced attack points with Abyss Dweller. It's interesting that he did not choose to redirect Stardust Spark's ability to the Mount Sylvania. But Suppose by not doing so, which he didn't really have to, he can keep Kane Gorgon for yeah, another attack. He's just thing. keeping those two effects alive. Because the pins are between the Abyss Dweller's effect and the, the Kane Gorgon's effect. So difficult for Lever to deal with here. Yep, he's not going to be able Especially to Especially with, like, the two either. cards left in his hand. <laughs> I, you know, I don't even think he has enough fire monsters right now to activate Blaster, even if he wanted to. But we're going to check for Mount Sylvania anyways, and at that point, Abyss Dweller's effect is used. So, Levert does not get to rearrange the top and two cards it's of his over. deck, but it doesn't really matter, <coughs> as it earns the concession from Leverett, and Trevetti takes game one. Now, Trevetti, actually, he's got a number 106 giant hand, the YCS prize card. I wonder if that could be particularly useful at some point in this match. Trevetti seems really well equipped for this matchup, mm -hmm. especially for games two and three. He's playing Soul Release, two copies in a side deck, which has been... A, a, was a big card coming into the weekend, and saw a, a great deal of talk Saturday morning. We didn't really see it appear in future matches, even at the top tables. But now that we're looking at the top 64 deck lists, it's definitely made an impact, and Trevetti is almost guaranteed to bring that in for this matchup to cut off those Soul Charges and Miracle Fertilizers. And while he's at it, he's probably going to bring in both Dimensional Fisher and Macro Cosmos. Whereas Leverett has only two Mystical Space Typhoons in his side deck to help deal with them. And none of them are main decked either. Well, Leverett does also have a rivalry of warlords, which could prove helpful here. It could. He'll, he's especially lucky in this case because Trevetti only has that one wiretap and doesn't have anything else for traps other than a pair of mystical space typhoons. Although I'd suspect those typhoons would come in as well to deal at least with the field spell, even though he hasn't seen a trap card. I feel like Trevetti will probably bring in the typhoons for game two. Although for Trevetti, it's a question of like how many how many cards can he afford to swap out because he has so many candidates in his side deck that could cause Leverett problems in this matchup. Like I think he might but drop the lances here. Yeah, because he's got to anticipate really just like no no trap based interference yep. and what traps Leverett does have he hasn't seen yet. So Trevetti may be under the the impression that Leverett isn't even playing any traps mains. So. Though, given that he knew right away what he was playing against, I would not be shocked if Trevetti actually just knows everything already. Yeah. At this level, two reputable players, they've probably been speaking either directly with each other or about each other so far in this tournament. Who 
Who's taking me to see you to just recognize how ridiculous that Karen Gorgon play was? How good was that? That was pretty good. <laughs> Definitely card we've seen. See some regional top eight play and some national championships, uh, like top cut play over the past while, but still fairly, fairly uncommon. And really it's a workshop on why you should play that card. He really just doesn't see a lot of play. And with its attack points, its attack, its attack points are in a fantastic place right now where you need to get past 2,400 things. Yeah. Now that 2,450, coupled with the 1,950 DF even can be pretty valuable. But the effect is deceptively useful. It's just tricky. A lot of people overlook it because they're not entirely certain how it works. Yes. All right. We're back for game two. Leverett's going to start us off. Let's see if Leverett can pull off one of those enormous opening turns we've been seeing from Sylvan's all weekend. He starts off with terraforming. He really, really wants to see that Mount Sylvania. Actually, come to think of it, he could sign out the upstart goblins if he needed to. Yeah, definitely gives them some space. Two terraforming, two Mount Sylvania in his main deck. Leverett looks markedly happier than he did in game one. Yeah. Seems like he's drawn something you know, other than just a defensive monster. Yeah. Starts off with Marshall Leaf. Doing a blind excavation for two. That's interesting. Hits nothing. It's Foolish Burial and Curry Bandit. Neither's a plant, so they both go to the bottom of the deck. Mount Sylvania's next. Two face down cards. And he opts not to use the Sylvania ability. Probably hmm. smart here. But Tezrevetti has the ice hand to punish his play. And Leverett uses Book of Moon to flip the ice hand down, delaying what might be the inevitable. The tricky thing with Sylvania is that once you get it out there, ice hand can really do a number on you. Yeah. But Leverett's certainly not, not ignorant of that. He must have some sort of plan here. Three face down cards join the now set ice hand. And Leverett goes ahead and so. excavates a Sylvan Sage Koya, which is not useful in this instance because he has no Sylvan mm, cards. Nothing in his to reuse. Now he seems to be indicating he's using the effect of Mount Sylvania, oh. discarding the Hermitry. No interfering MST from Trevetti. Getting that Hermitry out of his hand is huge because if he's got any sort of recursive ability, and judging from the fact that he's picked up Sylvan Princess Sprout to go to the top of his deck, I would guess he's got a Soul Charge. Possibly Fertilizer, since he did use the Normal Summon on turn one instead of waiting until he had a more concrete play. Yeah, that would explain the opening. But it's one of the two. He there we go. Fertilizer. fertilizer is used targeting Hermitry. Hermitry is summoned. Nothing yet from Trevetti. The effect is activated, and Trap Trick's Trap Hole Nightmare is changed. Since the Hermitry was special summoned this turn, Trap Trick's Trap Hole Nightmare can swallow it up and negate its ability. And when I said Soul Charge or Miracle Fertilizer, uh, it turns out it's Soul Charge and, and Miracle, Miracle Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Throw down both. Soul Charge for two brings back Hermitry and Sage Koya. Zach Leverett, very good in the sequencing of his plays, not just obviously in this match, but just over the history of his career. Uh, he's learned a, a lot of moves sort of on a, a rote basis, so he recalls them instantaneously. We've seen him play like Mermails extremely quickly, extremely systematically, and successfully in the past. And right now he's explaining what the and if you do in Sylvan <laughs> Hermitry's effect means. Even though he does draw a card... Uh, it was not the last thing that happened. Drawing a card and sending Princess Sprout to the graveyard are the last thing that happened. So he can form a chain. Princess Sprout, chain link one. Sage Koya, chain link two. And get both of them to the field. Next up, taking a nice long look at his extra deck. Uh, we were unable to hear what level was called for Sylvan Princess Sprout. She can adjust from between one to eight. I would guess it would be eight. Yeah, assumably it's eight yeah. because he had another seven. So he has access to Sylvan High Arbiter, Divine Dragonite Felgrand, 
uh, Alce, Sylvan Protector. He's playing actually two copies of Araya, the Sylvan High Arbiter, the Rank 7 monster mm -hmm. from Primal Origin, which is something I've always wanted to do because it's such a good card. I just can't find space for it most mm -hmm. of the time. But There's so many options of Rank 7 or Rank 8 in this deck. Yep, looks like he has. Yep, Princess Sprout was, in fact, level 8. And oh. she's being used along with Hermitry to Ixie Summon. Sylvan or Divine? Leverett asking some sort of inquiry to determine his next play. And he goes with Alce yeah. in defense position. 3,200 defense, very relevant. Uh, lets him excavate every turn. Okay, would have been relevant. Blackhorn of Heaven has put a stop to that. But he's still got those two level 7 materials around, neither of which has used their own excavation ability. Five Buck says that's the one he actually wanted. <laughs> yep. First things first. He goes ahead and uses a tree effect. Uh, hits Sylvan Charity, not a plant, goes to the bottom. Mount Sylvania, also not a plant, goes to the bottom. You gotta wonder, has he counted how many plants he's used so far? And that's why he's gone ahead and used the excavation effect there. Yeah. He goes for Mecha Phantom Beast Dracosac in defense position. Very useful card to have around, both for its defensive properties and the fact that it can create tokens for you to use for synchro summons. For example, two tokens and a spore at regular level is Black Rose Dragon, the second ability of which you can actually use in a Sylvan deck to turn things to attack position, drop their attack to zero. Won some games that way. Uh, also, if you've got the spore in your graveyard along with a um, Marsha Leaf, you can drop the two tokens and bring out spore at a boosted level four and go for a level 10. And since it's three materials, this is an especially good play against Lightsworn to get Hello. out of the justice, justice decisive, armor. decisive armor. Yeah. Which has been tremendous this weekend. As it stands, though, we're just seeing a lot of monsters in defense position. No chances taken because he knows that Ice Hand is there waiting <laughs> to blow away Mount Sylvania or possibly his face down card. And play is back to Trevetti. He's going to go ahead and flip the Ice Hand back face up. Strong enough to take on the Marshal Leaf, or a token. He goes for the Marshal Leaf. And Ice Hand is now joined by two more Speller Trap cards. But in this case, Leverett does have the ability to plink them away with Dracosac over the course. And Trevetti could be turns. bleeding some cards here over the next the next short little while if he doesn't do something quick. He activates Artifact Ignition before the end phase to destroy Mount Sylvania, stop any more excavations from going on, and then Artifact Begaltac. Is that Begaltac? Yeah. Very interesting. That would indicate to me that he's got another Ignition somewhere that he intends to use to destroy his own Begaltac and then put a moral attack there for Begaltech to come back and destroy. Lever goes ahead and checks his graveyard. Now he's definitely probably counting. Yeah. And I believe we are still in Trevetti's end phase. That also suggests that Trevetti has a moral attack set. Quite possible. And the, the Beagle Talk is taken missed, out because its effect can only work on Leverett's turn. Absolutely. Excellent play. Upstar Goblin is next. Looks like he kept him in. And Leverett at this point just wants to simplify like crazy since he's he's popping cards with Dracosac for free. He wants Trevetti to have as few cards as humanly possible. And he still has that Spore locked and loaded. Taking a look, doing a quick count, it looks like. Activates Dracosac's ability, tributes one token to destroy Ice Hand. Now that he doesn't have a Speller Trap, Ice because Hand's effect was kind can't activate. Destroy him, Ice Hand is out of luck, and Dracosac's other ability brings down two more tokens. That's nine levels 
worth of tokens. That opens up a lot of options with Spore. Miracle Fertilizer is next. And oh, there was, in fact, another set artifact ignition. Yep. It's used to destroy the Miracle Fertilizer, and now Moraltak is set. There's only one mystery left to be unraveled on Tez Trevetti's side of the field. And the question is, is that a real trap or another artifact? It, it is, is a real haunted. trap. And I believe he's got the Galtac. There it is. Which he uses to destroy a Moraltac. Now he's got two level 5 light monsters on the field and Moraltac destroys one of the tokens. Leverett's done for his turn. Trevetti's up next, and he's got the Xyz materials for something vastly unpleasant to the Sylvan Duelist. He's got a Volcasaurus in his extra deck. He's got Constellar Pleiades, which is the real worry here, because it can knock Dracosac right back to the extra deck without it being able to do anything. Firehand joins the two level 5 monsters. And he's thinking about what the order of actions is to leave Leverett with nothing on field. Really, you can do it either way. You can attack the tokens mm -hmm. first, or you can just exceed summon for Pleiades right now. Trevetti attacking the tokens. Attacks the tokens. Main phase two. Exceed summons Consular Pleiades. And attaches one to send Dracosac right back to the extra deck. And now Leverett is in, tr is doomed. Yeah, that the dimensional fissure is the dagger in this one. He can get the spore back, but unless he's drawn something really special, it's just I going mean, straight back to the hand. Yeah, Trevetti hasn't Pleiades. locked down under the the Pleiades. He just doesn't have enough action to get around that the spell speed two effect. In this case, he's going to take twenty five and sixteen from Firehand and Consular Pleiades. And then it looks like Trivetti is going to use Pleiades' effect oh. to bounce Call of the Haunted back to his hand. That gives him another play on Leverett's turn to bring back Artifact Moraltok in response effect. to whatever Leverett plays to just destroy it. It's going to develop his field any more, well, even more, while still giving him that uh, two that opportunity to respond. Banished. One from the hand, one from the graveyard, to summon Blaster. And it's really just the last ditch attempt that isn't going to get there. Call of the Haunted is up. Moraltak will be summoned, but Lever doesn't need to see it. He knows this one is over. Oh. Ted Trevetti is victorious over Zachary Leverett. Winning two games to none. Great plays from Tej Trevetti. Great yeah, use of the synergy between his cards to create really, these lose-lose really situations while still continuing to develop his board position. That's why it's so dangerous. Like, you can get bad hands, but most of the time, you're going to get something nasty that the opponent will have to really work to get around. Really well played by Trevetti. Because you have to get around the hands and the artifacts. And this, and that, and the regular traps. On what both seem like weak openings for Leverett. Mm -hmm. No no big signature Sylvan moves. Yeah, the second one was a little better, but you could kind of tell that it wasn't what he was looking for no. when he had to blind excavate with Marshall Leaf on the first Yesterday turn. we watched Ron Davis in a feature match. Sylvan his way into a turn one Coach King Gian trainer for 2,400 damage and four extra cards. We did not see that from Zach Leverett in this match. It's a shame. Another <laughs> Sylvan deck out of the tournament. Yeah. Tejavetti moves on to the top 32. Well in the hunt for a seat at the World Championship in Rimini, Italy in three weeks. Just a few more wins away. Meanwhile, at the same time, we've got the D Dragon Duel World Championship qualifier running at the same time. We should be winding down the semifinals of that, and uh, when it's finished, I believe we're going to bring the finals of it. That is the plan right now. We should be seeing the finals of the Dragon Duels in a few minutes. That'll be up next. All right.